The Trump trial looms it's right around the corner, and we know that when Trump goes to court, kind of a big ordeal. We saw what happened the last time he was in New York City, kind of brought the whole city to a screeching halt, and the whole country came to a pause. But Trump is scheduled for trial. This is a civil trial involving E. Jean Carroll, and the judge wants to know who's going to show up here, who's going to physically be present. Is E. Jean Carroll going to be there? And secondarily, is Donald Trump going to be there? Trump and his team are hinting at yes, unless they get their way and the judge gives an inclusion of a particular instructions. But first, let's talk about this actual case. What the heck is going on here? E. Jean Carroll is the person who brought this lawsuit. It was brought in about 2019, right around that era. And it was delayed for many, many years. People were asking, why didn't this get brought up? anytime more recent or, or, or sooner back to the date of the event, but it involves E. Jean Carroll. She's allegedly a victim of an assault that took place in a department store back in 1995. And the complaint was filed. I'll just share a quick snippet of this. You can see filed it some time ago in November of 2022, but actually before that, when Trump was president, and this is sort of a, it's, it's rejuvenating an old case because Trump was president and everything got put on hold there for a little bit of time. So the case is rejuvenated and it came back. And there was a lot of question about how this case originated in the first place and why did it come about? Because E. Jean Carroll, according to her, this happened back in the 1990s. Why did it take so long? Well, it has to do with these people. A lot of people were saying, sue Trump, just sue Trump. Just go after him. You'll get a lot of money. You'll get a lot of prestige. Everybody will be thrilled about it. And she said, no, there's no basis. There's no reason to do it until she met this guy called George Conway. George Conway sat down with her, known TDSer, known hater of Donald Trump, and said that, hey, I think you do have a valid claim and you should sue. And she said, really, you do? And he said, yeah, I do. She said, do you have a lawyer? Guess what? He did, ready to go. Her name was Roberta Kaplan. Roberta Kaplan said, I'd love to work on this case, grabbed the case, started representing E. Jean Carroll, the lawsuit was filed, this lawsuit has been going on for a long time, lots of litigation, lots of legal time, lawyers, right, spending a lot of time and effort to investigate these claims. And that costs money and nobody works for free. So what is happening with the funding, right? This is a contingency case, which means the lawyers are really only technically getting paid if they win, but somebody still has to fund this and pay for the costs and the expenses up until the trial. And who is doing that? Well, we learned that the attorney, Roberta Kaplan, communicated over to Alina Abba that that person's name is Reed Hoffman, billionaire founder of LinkedIn, somebody who detests Donald Trump and has created several different organizations to stop him from succeeding, is funding the lawsuit and funding the litigation. So we've got a lot of questions about this lawsuit. Is it legitimate? I mean, it's very old. Is it being brought without bias? Is it really being brought to secure a victory for E. Jean Carroll? Or is this brought by partisan people who are trying to use this lawsuit as a cudgel, as a sword against Donald Trump and the ongoing battle of lawfare that we've been covering here for ages as it comes and relates to Donald Trump? So let's take a look now at the actual request. This came in from Trump's lawyers. You see this was drafted and sent into the court on April 14th. We're talking about jury instructions. Short document was filed in response. This comes out from Joseph Tacopina, Trump's lawyer. And he says, Dear Judge, I am here by and through counsel undersigned and I respectfully submit this letter requesting that the court conduct jury selection using procedures outlined herein, including the use of a written questionnaire. We want to fill them, have them fill this out so we can read through it. They say, we also would like you to reconsider and modify a prior order that allows the attorneys to access the names of the jurors so that they can investigate these people and learn a little bit more about them. Look at their social media, look at their, you know, what they post, what they say, all the things they do so they can investigate them. They say, as set out more fully below, the relief sought by this motion is necessary in light of the exceptional circumstances of this case, and it's going to increase the chance that Trump gets a fair trial. So we want to know the names of these people so we can go look into them. And we want to know what they know in a written questionnaire so that we can parse through them. The judge has responded to this. Says, Mr. Trump's motion to employ a written juror questionnaire in selecting the jury is denied. The court makes only these points as a matter of emphasis, saying, look, the motion was made without regard for the fact that we already stated that we're not going to use a jury questionnaire. In other words, I already ruled on this. Don't ask again. 
But here, they say, as the court made clear in April 10, 2023, the law in this circuit is abundantly clear that the use of written jury questionnaires is entirely optional with the trial judge. What is required is, is that an appropriate voir dire, by whatever means is used, he says, that will be done. He, so he says, I'm going to do voir dire. I don't need to do it your way. I'm going to do it my way. This motion also proposes the use of a questionnaire that is notwithstanding the court's ruling that an anonymous jury is going to be used. And so here, the court denies the party's request to access the names. Nothing between now and then has changed. Judge Lewis Kaplan, right? In other words, he's telling Trump's team, you guys have already asked about this stuff and I've already defended this stuff and there's nothing else that I'm going to do about it. So that was on that order. Now, there was another order from this court in response to another filing. So Trump's lawyers submitted this one April 17th this week. And they said, dear judge, they say as counsel for Donald Trump, we write to inquire as to your court plan for conducting jury selection. It says we wanted to do the written questionnaire. You said no. We wanted to get their names. You said no. So what's the plan? On March 29th, counsel were generally advised by the clerk that your honor, you, plan to assemble about 100 potential jurors in the assembly room and tell them what the case is about. Like, this is your plan. The deputy clerk then indicated that your honor, the judge, would ask whether the jurors could be impartial, with the view that only about 15 jurors might be struck. The deputy clerk also indicated that your honor would not ask that many questions during the voir dire in the courtroom, and that the entire jury selection process would only take one to two hours. They say it was unclear, which is very, you know, very short for a case of this magnitude, because the, there are a lot of questions, you know, do you know Trump? Do you have any biases against Trump? Are you, you know, politically motivated? Who, you know, who'd you vote for? These types of things. And not that you could ask those questions, but that's what the attorneys are trying to extract out of the jurors. They say that it's unclear from this discussion, your honor, whether counsel would be present even in this process while the judge is asking questions of the jurors. We don't even know if we're going to be able to be there or have input in the court's description of the case or have our opportunity to answer questions. Therefore, Trump's team says we seek clarification on these points. And also, given the parties involved in this case, the attendant publicity surrounding it, the sensitivity of the issues involved, the possibility of political bias, we believe that a robust jury selection process is necessary and in the interest of justice. Now, the judge responds. And this judge is giving them some attitude. Okay, this is two memos back to back where we get some attitude. He says, all right, listen, Trump lawyer. He says, I take what I understand to be material inaccuracies in Mr. Tacopina's letter to be misunderstandings attributable to the fact that Tacopina was not present at the meeting attended by the other lawyers. All right, he's saying, we already talked about this there, dum dum." They know how this works. So he says, nevertheless, we're going to give you the following information about what's happening coming up on Tuesday. This is next week. The judge says the entire jury selection process will take place in the courtroom scheduled for trial in the presence of counsel for both sides. Lawyers will be there in the courtroom, the entire thing, as it would be inconvenient to accommodate the entire panel in that room one at a time. Part of the panel will be held in a reserve room under the appropriate court supervision. And they'll see and hear all related proceedings absent any sidebars. So the room's not big enough for everybody. So they're going to spread them out a little bit across a couple locations. The judge says from time to time, it may be appropriate to bring prospective jurors from the reserve room to replace them who've been excused in the other room. So we have a big room where the main jurors will be. And when they get excused, we may take people from the overflow room and bring them into the main room. The replacement prospective juror will then be voideered asked questions in the presence of all counsel once they're brought into the courtroom and seated. This is identical to how we handled juries during COVID. Counsel for both sides have been requested to submit proposed voir dire questions, and both have done so. And so the court is naturally taking those requests into account prior to its examination. So the judge is saying, I'm not going to let you ask questions. I'll ask the questions. You send me your questions, and I'll be the person who decides whether to ask them or not. Moreover, at the completion of the examinations and the specific jurors, counsel will have a further opportunity to suggest questions. All right, so the judge is going to be doing the questioning. Counsel will direct their questions to the judge. They'll all be there in the courtroom. They've got an overflow room. And the judge is going to use the same policies they used during COVID. And now, the judge is giving us some clarity what's going to be happening on Tuesday. And the judge also wanted to know 
about whether they were going to be present or not. So a big question, of course, who's going to show up for this thing? Who's going to physically be there? Is E. Jean Carroll going to be there? And is Donald Trump going to be there? Because remember what happens when Donald Trump comes into town, things get a little bit squirrely. This was filed by E. Jean Carroll's lawyers, Kaplan Hecker Fink LLP. They're in New York. April 18th, they say, Dear Judge Kaplan, we write pursuant to your honor's order dated in April to inform the court that E. Jean Carroll will be present throughout the trial. Respectfully submitted, Robert Kaplan. And Robert Kaplan, Roberta Kaplan, is the attorney representing E. Jean Carroll, obviously. So now the next question, is Donald Trump going to appear for trial? His lawyers say he certainly wants to. April 19th, this was drafted, sent out of Joseph Tacopina's office, Lawyer for Donald Trump, short memo, two pages. It says, Dear Your Honor, well, you know, in light of the court's order requesting counsel to advise whether their respective clients will be present throughout the trial, I say, Judge, we think it's necessary to bring the following concern to Your Honor's attention, given the unique status of our defendant client, Donald Trump, as a former president. Didn't. He says specifically, as counsel who appeared with defendant Trump during his recent arraignment in New York Supreme Court in People versus Trump indictment number ending in 2-3, says, I have personal knowledge of the logistical burdens associated with Trump appearing in a courtroom, much of which was witnessed on televised broadcast. As a former president, the defendant was always accompanied by approximately a dozen Secret Service agents. The FDR drive was shut down for a significant amount of time. While he traveled to the courthouse, the courthouse itself was frozen while he was there. And the streets within a three block radius of the courthouse were all blocked off. Trump's appearance at the SDNY in connection with this matter, your honor, that would result in similar logistical and financial burdens upon New York City, its residents and the court. And so they say with respect to the latter, in order for defendant Trump to appear, his movement would need to be coordinated preliminarily with the Secret Service, and their advance team hours beforehand each day that he's present and that tactical plan needs to be developed. As part of the plan, according to the Secret Service, courthouse floors would need to be locked down, elevators shut down, courthouse personnel confined to their offices, and members of the public restricted from the area. Although defendant Trump wishes to appear at trial. Now, this is an interesting paragraph, right? What we're seeing here is Trump flexing a little bit. They wanted a continuance in this trial. They don't want this trial to be going right now. And a big part of my question is, are they going to settle this in any way? We know that many of these lawsuits are political in nature. They're funded by billionaires. They're suggested by anti-Trumpers. They've been using lawfare for a long time. But does that mean they wouldn't settle for a bunch of money? Like if the Trump organization just paid them off, would they go away? What would they accept? Or is this more than about the money? Do they want pain? Now they write this. They say, although defendant Trump wishes to appear at trial, he wants to go. He wishes to be here, judge. And I still have a hard time wrapping my head around the idea of Donald Trump, former president, current presidential candidate leading, sitting in a courtroom looking at jurors who are weighing his fate in the eyes, wondering how that would go. So Trump says, look, I'd love to appear in order to, but in order to avoid the burdens that we've talked about above, if he does not do so, we respectfully request that the court give the jury a special preliminary instruction. Here's what they want the judge to inform the jurors, saying, while no litigant is required to appear at a civil trial, the absence of the defendant in this matter by design avoids the logistical burdens that his presence as the former president would cause the courthouse and New York City. Accordingly, his presence is excused unless and until he is called by either party to testify. So that's what they're saying. They're basically saying, your honor, you, you might, you might want to include this paragraph <clears throat> or else, you know, if you include what we want you to include, then we're going to save this area a whole lot of time and secret service and shutting down the courtrooms and all the things. So why don't you just include that uh, paragraph and just let us know. Now we'll see what Ro Ro Roberta Kaplan says, Judge Kaplan, Lewis Kaplan here, because the judge, I think it might rub him the wrong way a little bit. We'll see what he says. But basically Trump is saying, put this paragraph in or I'm going to show up. And if he shows up, then there's going to be some problems for the court. Thank you for joining us as we cover it. Thank you for hitting the subscribe button. Thank you for liking this video wherever it is you're watching it. And we'll look forward to seeing you as we carry on.